Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nancy Lee, uh, Senior Policy fellow, fellow here at the Center for Global Development. I'm delighted to welcome you all here this morning. I'm delighted that there are so many of you who've decided to join this conversation. I think you made the right decision. As far as in it, uh, I'm concerned, this is one of the fundamental and perhaps most urgent uh, set of issues in, in development. Um, and it, but it's also among the most complex. And exactly because of this complexity, um, we need to share analysis uh, and evidence, and we need to do so frequently and across a broad range of partners. Um, let me say at the outset, we are very proud to be hosting this event with Women for Women International, which works with the most marginalized women uh, in countries affected by war and conflict. <clears throat> so I think what I'll do is start with three basic questions. Um, first of all, who are the ultra poor? Uh, second of all, why focus on women? And third, uh, why focus on graduation programs? So we can sort of get a basic set of data on the table. So the ultra poor are generally unable to meet their most basic needs. They earn significantly less than the extreme poverty threshold of $1.90 a day as established by the World Bank. Um, one estimate puts the number of ultra poor at something like 400 million, and that's as compared to the 770 million defined by the World Bank as the extreme poor, so a substantial fraction of the extreme poor. They're often food and housing insecure. They have few or no assets. They lack skills and education. They're often vulnerable to natural disasters and climate change. They're often disconnected from government services and from markets as well. And they can be in poor help. Women are overrepresented among the extreme poor, especially young women. A 2018 UN report finds that women from 25 to 35, prime working and childbearing age, are 22% more likely than men to live in extreme poverty. Uh, the ultra poor are disproportionately found in women headed households and often in communities with restrictions on access to opportunities for women. And graduation programs generally offer people a productive asset, a small amount of money or consumption support, some technical or uh, life skill training, and some health care. So in short, they're offering a multifaceted solution to a multifaceted set of problems. And the good news is that there is evidence of efficacy. Studies of graduation programs show increases in income, in assets, and in health, not just at the end of the program, but at a period of time after the program. Moreover, it's salient that ultra-poverty is concentrated in relatively few countries, 14 countries, 11 in Africa, and 3 in Asia, according to one re report, account for 80% of the global ultra-poor. So this is a conversation about the opportunity to eliminate ultra-poverty if we concentrate resources in the most effective programs with a strong and accurate gender focus and in the right countries. But that's not necessarily what we're doing. A CGD review of interventions aimed at improving economic outcomes for women found that only 24% target the very poor, and many of the interventions lack the data to determine the baseline poverty levels of um, the beneficiaries and therefore lack the ability to target interventions to women at different poverty levels. Evaluations often, often focus narrowly on academic gains rather than more broadly on women's agency and women's power. And those are the things that make gains sustainable. So what we want to do today is talk about where we are and where we're going. We have a superb panel of practitioners and researchers, which I'll introduce in a moment. 
Uh, and we will definitely will want to include you in the conversation, so be thinking of your questions. Uh, but first, I want to turn to Eva Noble, Senior Research Officer at Women for Women International, who, started, who will start us off with a presentation. And then I will invite the panel up to the podium. Thank you. Center for Global Development about gender and graduation approaches. Women for Women International supports the most marginalized women in countries affected by conflict and war. Through our 12-month social and economic training program, women learn about the value of their work in the family and local economy, their role in decision making, the importance of women's rights, basic health practices, and the benefits of working together for social and economic purposes. The training delivered to groups of 25 women, includes modules on life skills, numeracy, businesses, and I think my alarm clock is going off. Can you hand that to my partner right behind you? <laughs> oh yeah, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's really embarrassing. So our program includes training to 25 women. We have modules on life skills, numeracy, business practices, a vocational training, and a chosen track. And participants receive a cash transfer. Our program is supporting women to earn and save money, improve health and well-being, influence decisions in their home and community, and to connect to support networks. And we measure on these outcomes regularly. With enhanced skills, knowledge, and resources, women are better able to create sustainable change for themselves, their families, and their communities. Our program started in 1993 as a direct cash transfer to women in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It has since evolved into our multifaceted approach we use today. We know that linking short-term economic support for women with their longer-term empowerment is critical to realizing their rights and reducing their poverty and vulnerability. This is especially true where women are affected by conflict, which both exacerbates existing and adds new challenges and barriers that ultra-poor women confront. In these contexts, women face a lack of infrastructure, governance, protection, increased economic shocks, market instability, as well as increases in both conflict-driven and domestic violence. Conflicts can also open new opportunities to women because men do most of the fighting and oftentimes most of the dying in conflict, women take increased leadership inside the home and in employment opportunities previously unavailable. However, progress is short-lived without links to long-term transformational efforts. The search for solutions benefiting the most marginalized, ultra-poor women has led to a convergence of fields of practice. It's folks thinking about gender equality, thinking about post-conflict response and recovery, and others thinking about poverty alleviation. At Women for Women International, we're particularly interested in how graduation approaches for the Bolt Report can be best designed to generate not only economic, but social gains for women. The graduation approaches are proliferating. The range of interventions considered to be a graduation approach is actually expanding. BRAC pioneered the graduation model in Bangladesh in the early 2000s. And now we have close to 100 programs in nearly 50 countries addressing different needs of target populations. Among these is Women for Women International's program. And we're eager to learn from similar programs and adapt our model based on proven good practices. Evidence on graduation models sustained economic impact is robust and compelling. For example, a recent evaluation of Village Enterprise's graduation approach showed that their bundled program achieved higher economic impact than a cost-equivalent cash transfer. However, as Nancy has highlighted, many evaluations of graduation approaches lack sufficient data on women's empowerment, things like agency, financial control, unpaid labor burdens. The studies that do measure women's empowerment show complex effects. For example, a study in Bangladesh found that women initially spend more time on their self-employment activities, but they later revert to spending that time on household chores. 
In another study, evaluators found that women retained control of an asset transferred to them during the program, but any assets acquired with subsequent earnings were still in the men's names. In JPAL and IPA's pivotal evaluation of graduation approaches in six countries, women's decision making was one of the only outcome categories that did not show sustained gains 12 months after program completion. As we built our own research portfolio to look at the impact of our bundled approach, we've reviewed the evidence from relevant sectors, and we've launched studies to try and fill in some of the gaps. I'm proud to say that in addition to our comprehensive programmatic monitoring and evaluation, we have one recently completed and two other ongoing randomized control trials looking at different outcomes related to women's social and economic empowerment. As part of DFID's What Works to Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls program, we are measuring our program's effects on intimate partner violence and gender norms in Afghanistan. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, we are investigating how our program impacts women's decision-making agency, mental health, and cognition. We are also studying in what ways women benefit from the additional participation of a spouse or male household member in four months of men's engagement programming. In Nigeria, we're taking a look at how programmatic variations, participating in village savings and loans associations, or receiving six months of follow-up mentoring visits affect the profitability and sustainability of women entrepreneurs' businesses. Because women's empowerment is multifaceted, our research and learning agenda is designed to measure impact across many social and economic outcomes. We're really excited to share what we learn in the coming months and continue asking difficult questions of ourselves, our program, and of the community at large. Indeed, as a researcher, I tend to bring more questions than answers to the table. So in closing, I would like to pose three measurement questions to this community. First, if women are working more hours on their income generating activities, is that because they are spending less time on unpaid labor demands like housework or care, or is it because they're giving up sleep or leisure time? Observing increases in a woman's productive hours should not be enough to deem a program successful. Encouraging women to work more outside the home without attention to the gender imbalance of household tasks will simply add to their responsibilities or in some cases shift these domestic burdens to other women in the home, limiting other women's educational or employment opportunities. Gendered evaluation frameworks are critical to ensuring that we ask questions about how interventions affect women's whole lives and not one conveniently quantifiable metric. Second, what does economic empowerment require beyond improving women's economic outcomes? So according to the women that we serve, quite a bit. When they're asked to define women's economic empowerment and where they would like to be, women talk about gaining control in their lives, talk about control of financial assets and decision making. They want control over decisions not needing permission to leave their home, to earn or spend money, to seek health care or the like. In short, they're talking about agency. This leads me to my third question. How can we more robustly measure the richness and nuance of women's agency? Many evaluations assess participation in household decision making, but I want to ask this, is that actually enough? Agency is often defined as the capacity to make decisions about one's own life and act on them to achieve desired outcomes free of violence, retribution, or fear. It's a complex concept interpreted differently across the disciplines involved in our research, like psychology or economics, interpreted differently in the languages spoken by the women we serve, especially challenging when there isn't a one-to-one -one translation between our concepts and words in the local languages. Agency is difficult to measure, but as a community, we need to strive to do better, given its importance to women's empowerment and inclusion. So I ask these questions about evaluating women's economic empowerment and agency because the ways we think about gender and program design and the evaluative frameworks, the questions that we ask about the, how the programs affect women determine the evidence that we generate and share. Evidence from better research questions will shape graduation approaches that better serve women, which after all is the whole point. So with that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to our wonderful panelists. I thank you all for joining us and I'm excited to hear the conversation about graduation approaches and women's empowerment. Thank you very much.
right? <laughs> For the panel. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eva, for that excellent start to our conversation and for those um, really well-framed and thoughtful uh, questions. Um, uh, we have uh, an excellent panel here today, and I said of both uh, researchers and practitioners, so let me introduce them very uh, briefly. You have their bios. Uh, Lori Adams is the chief executive officer to, to the far right of uh, Women for Women International with over 25 years of experience in international development and women's rights. Nate Goldberg uh, directs IPA's social protection program, which uses rigorous evaluations to improve and scale social safety nets and livelihood opportunities. Kate McGee is the transition director for the Partnership for Economic Inclusion, whose mission is to expand sustainable livelihoods for ultra-poor households and vulnerable individuals. And Linda Scott is Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Oxford University and the Senior Advisor of the Global Business Coalition for Women's Economic Empowerment. So as you can see, uh, we have some of the seminal and uh, key players um, in this uh, space. So uh, let me start off uh, with Kate um, to give us a brief history, perhaps if you can uh, condense it into a few minutes of the graduation model, how it's evolved, the kinds of actors that use graduation models and why, and how gender lenses are incorporated or not incorporated um, in, in the design of graduation approaches today. Well, thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here. I have to say this is my most favorite topic and professional passion, so it's really thrilling to be here. So I want, I, I, it was striking to me that Eva, you had three questions and I've been thinking in threes as well. The way I see it, this work is progressing through three waves. And maybe they can be characterized as experimentation, expansion, and then empowerment. Those I think are the three waves for this field. The first wave was really the, the proof point that even extreme poor, even ultra poor households through the women in the households could make significant gains in income, assets, and resilience. This was huge. This is counterintuitive. It's a very striking finding. It gives us the base, but as Eva pointed out, it really was not adequate in peeling the onion on what was happening inside that household. The quantitative impact evidence is, is focused on a household level. There's a rich qualitative base that is suggestive of empowerment uh, outcomes in many settings, but it's just we're not quite there. And we did not have a sufficiently sophisticated theory of change about what was supposed to happen through this intervention. So it's a huge foundation to build on, this first wave of experimentation. Now, we have both the second and third waves going on at the same time. So the second wave is around scaling, and particularly around scaled adoption, adaptation, continuous improvement by large players. And governments are uh, very noteworthy here. As Eva mentioned, there are, well, as of 18 months ago, there were over 100 graduation type programs around the world. We're looking at this, we're doing this survey again, and the, um, it's very noteworthy to see the increase in the number of governments that looked at the impact findings, and it was a very interesting phenomenon we weren't expecting. Social protection, national social protection system said, we don't wanna just keep people afloat, we want mobility and opportunity, and if this is an intervention that can be built on, added into our social protection or poverty reduction or BSLA, self-help group initiatives, uh, even smallholder productivity, we want that. And that's a very important trend, government adoption. But there are other scalers too. World Vision is the largest NGO in the world, or maybe it's BRAC. Both of them have uh, committed to significant scaling of this, and BRAC has already served 
one and a half million households. And World Vision has adopted this as the way they do economic empowerment for households uh, that are vulnerable. But we also see the World Bank, multi -development ba multilateral development banks, UNICEF, UNHCR, FAO. So there's a large group of organizations that are working on this, including, and I think this is very important to Women for Women's mission as well, in the accelerating the transition from humanitarian to development type assistance. So that is a field that really is interested in this. The third wave is on empowerment. And um, this is a proof point that we really need to build. As we've been discussing, it's more than economic gains. We do need to look at the agency and control, the, the gender dimensions, but also the age and ethnicity and other aspects of marginalization. Uh, and the unintended consequences, and the core and very personal process of human development. So I think it's very exciting that these second and third waves are happening together. We can cross-fertilize, we can reinforce the messages between them, and the women's empowerment dimension of this is obviously the most powerful and uh, the one that we need to really be sure doesn't get left in our desire for scaling. Thanks so much. That's, that's a really helpful uh, three-wave framing. And um, uh, let me turn now to Nate who, and to take us a little bit further into the nature of the evidence on efficacy um, and specifically the outcomes issue versus the empowerment and agency issue for women. Um, and, and just give us a sense from the, the research, the body of research, um, what are the lessons we've learned so far, uh, you know, the good and the bad. What, what is working and what's, and what's not working? Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for, for having me on this panel. I'm really delighted to be here. Like Kate, I will speak in terms of, of waves, in this case in terms of the research, uh, rather than the, the scaling and the implementation. So. Uh, I, IPA at this point has uh, nine randomized evaluations of graduation programs that have been completed. We have four that are now underway, and that's growing. And those are joining a growing body of researchers uh, and implementers who are partnering together to test out uh, new variations of graduation type of programming and trying to improve outcomes both on economic and empowerment measures. So the evidence base that we have from those original, the first wave of studies is, is consistent and strong. Some of you may have, have seen, we published in 2015 in the journal Science, we took the uh, first six of the sites that we had done with the randomized evaluations, where we had a, a two-year and a three-year follow-up. So we did a baseline survey, and then we did at the end of the program, two-year program, right at the end of the program. And we went back a full year after the program had completed. Uh, and we, we grouped those together. So you have there 20,000 people in 10,000 households in six countries. So a really large body of evidence. Uh, and there you see that in, in five of the six sites, it worked very well. Uh, there, there, was, there was one exception, but it, for, for the rest of those, and the one exception is kind of an implementation issue. But uh, mostly you see strong impacts uh, across all of the sites. Uh, and we measured a return on investment of 166% across all of those sites. Now, in the better programs, it was up to 250 or even 430%. Uh, and there, what we're doing is it's the cost-benefit analysis, and we're taking just the economic impacts. And so there, it's increases in consumption and household assets. And uh, because we saw a very consistent impact from year two to year three, uh, we're able to kind of project those out into the future uh, and assume that those impacts will continue over time, but we're, it's, we're discounting that into a net present value. And we're measuring all the costs of delivering the program. So staff salaries, fuels, vehicle, rent, management time, et cetera. Uh, in addition to the, the economic returns, though, we, we measure 10 families of outcomes. So, uh, some of those are, are economic and some of those are kind of represent a, a wider set of impacts. And we found positive impacts in every single family of outcomes that we looked at. 
So that includes income, assets, food security, and also mental health, physical health, and women's empowerment. Those were all statistically significant and positive at two years. In three years, most of those remain statistically significant. But two of those kind of fell off by year three. Uh, the direction is still positive, but no longer statistically significant. And that included women's empowerment uh, and physical health. So there's some cause for concern there. And it maybe makes us think that we have to think about what the programming is if we want to create longer term impacts. Uh, we've gone then since, and in a couple of the sites, actually three of the sites now, we've collected longer term follow up. So uh, at seven years, uh, and in both in India, and our partners at uh, JPAL and LSE collected uh, seven year follow up uh, with BRAC in Bangladesh. And there you see that the economic impacts are actually even continuing <coughs> over time. So that gives us kind of a justification and kind of uh, ex post that the decisions we made around the, the cost benefit uh, seem to be justified. Although now we're, we're analyzing some data uh, in a long term follow up in Ethiopia, and there we're seeing some of the results are sustained where the control group is catching up on some of the other measures. So that's a, a bit of a puzzle that we're going to have to figure out kind of what's going on in, in that context. The final finding that I would like to highlight is, is the distribution of impacts. So we looked at the, the distribution of all of the impacts of the, the treatment group compared to the control group. And there we see that there's some real superstars who, uh, from participating in this program, it really kind of unlocked that poverty trap and put them on a path out of poverty. Uh, whereas others, they do just, just a very little bit better than the control group. Uh, so even on the economic outcomes, there's, there's some room for improvement there. Uh, I'll turn to some of the, the limitations of the, the first wave of studies. The first is that this is a household level, level intervention, and so that affected the way that, that we did the research. So uh, it's, a, it's a program that is targeted at the household, but usually there's a, there's a woman who's identified as the kind of primary participant within the household. Within that large data set that we had, we had very few men uh, who were considered the, the participant. So in that sense, uh, we don't have a lot of data to be able to compare men to women for participating in the household. Uh, also, the measures that we had on, on women's empowerment, uh, I, there have been some improvements that have been made since. So we used an index of female decision-making power. Uh, and these were five categories, all based on household purchasing decisions. So, so we asked whether the female in the household was the primary decision-maker in food-related spending decisions, education, health, home improvement, and household finances. So that's not a very complete way to measure women's agency. I would argue we maybe do a little bit better if you include the index that we had of political involvement. So there you have uh, whether uh, uh, women voted in the last election, is a member of a political party, attended village meeting, and spoke with village leaders about village concerns. But still, I think we can do uh, a lot better. So there's a big improvement uh, recently in improving the way that we measure women's empowerment, uh, particularly in kind of quantitative surveys. And we're incorporating many of those improvements in the new wave of evaluations. So the easiest is just to collect more data on the household member-specific economic outcomes within the household. So for the women in the household, for the men in the household, uh, we want to know about consumption at the person level, food security at the, at the individual level. Better, we want to know whether uh, who in the household is, is controlling the assets and, and the cash. For example, uh, does the wife give the asset over to the husband? Who makes the decisions about investments? Who controls revenue? Who owns other assets, et cetera? And we also want to capture a broader set of impacts. Uh, so that could include uh, the hidden cost of participating in the program. Uh, Ava mentioned some, some of these issues, time use. Uh, so when you promote new activities, who's taking over the other activities? So uh, does that fall on other women in the household? Uh, does it fall on children? Uh, we want to be able to, to measure those, those types of things to capture that kind of complete picture of, of program impact. Thanks. That's great, uh, Nate. I, I think the, um, what's, you know, among the many interesting things that you just described, the fact that 
um, the cost efficiency aspect, I think, um, is, is worth emphasizing. Because I think at the beginning of these interventions, people were very concerned that it was a complicated intervention and it would, the cost-benefit um, uh, comparison would not be favorable. But you, clearly, the evidence suggests the opposite. And we can come back to questions you raised about measuring uh, economic empowerment and also allocation of women's time if, if they're doing um, more income earning uh, activities. Um, so, Lori, now turning to you, because um, your organization works in some of the most difficult um, environments, and, and you all have decided to, to do this on the ground, um, and you've taken a, an approach of bundling services and testing graduation models. So I wanted to get a sense of, as a practitioner, why you went in that direction um, and how you're engaging with others who are um, deploying graduation models. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh, like Kate said, I'm so thrilled to be here because to have the women's rights community meet the graduation community and finally bring together sort of humanitarian conflict, conflicts, development, and women's rights all in one space is something I've been working on for 25 years and it feels like it's finally happening. So I'm thrilled about that. And, and that's the story of why I, as a practitioner, came to believing that you have to take an integrated approach. I had been working, I, I was leading m and &E efforts for, for nine years in an organization that worked in 44 countries. I was managing um, large programs, humanitarian development and advocacy across 22 countries. And the way our aid industry works that leads to a great project on women's political participation and then a great project on livelihoods and then a great project on girls' education, none of which are connected, all of which are in different villages, was driving me crazy. And as I was trying to change my previous organizations to restructure the incentives and the financing mechanisms, it just, it, it was really, really difficult. Um, and so actually a baroness in the UK, I was working in the UK, said, you need to go check out Women for Women International. They do what you're trying to get us to do. And so that's how I came to Women for Women International, because a Women for Women was bringing together social and economic, and we don't talk about it, but also political in the sense of women's decision making and engagement at community level and household level. How Women for Women came there, I think, is fascinating. Women for Women is 25 years old, was founded by a woman in her 20s, an Iraqi survivor of violence and war herself, who was literally getting cash from Americans and taking it directly to women in Bosnian rape camps. So a 25-year-old cash transfer program, didn't call it a cash transfer program, called it sisterhood and sponsorship, but it was a cash transfer program. And very quickly found out this doesn't work for women who are stigmatized, thrown out of their families, thrown out of their communities, made to feel blamed. To have just cash is not enough. So the women said that the bringing together of women together so that they could heal the psychosocial healing was equally powerful. And to this day, 25 years later, you know, the, my most recent visit uh, to Rwanda, the women was running this massive beekeeping cooperative. And I said, you must be so proud that you're having these huge economic gains. And she said, I'm really proud that I can help my sisters. So that connection to other women to be able to support each other, the psychosocial healing um, proved very important. But then women also said, and in Bosnia and Kosovo, where we first started, a lot of women had been working in the home. And so now they have some cash, and they, say they have some support. But how do you run a successful business? So year after year, women kept telling us, because we have a very participatory methodology, we need business training. We need vocational training. We need health. We need the support of our men. So each year, we've layered on additional things. Most recently, well, in 2002, men's engagement, because we found that we really needed to bring the community along. And I think there's, there's three things that come out of this that, um, that I think are, are really exciting to bring the graduation community and, and our work together. One is having worked in conflict-affected areas, you can't necessarily rely on the state in a place like South Sudan or Congo to be the one that's going to be helping the most ultra-poor women and communities. Who do those women rely on? They rely on their community. So there's much more of a need to go beyond an individual or household approach to a community approach. And so we have a change agent program when we work with men, and we're really working to figure out what is the collective way so that, because frankly, women I've talked to in Congo, the women we work with in South Sudan, you see great impact. And our impact, we measure it one year out and two years out after the intervention is over. And the and impact is sustained, interestingly, more on the social side than on the economic in our situation. And I think that might be because of being redisplaced. 
right? So you build up a successful business, you get redisplaced again. This happens over and over. Sometimes people say to me, isn't it a problem that she learned beekeeping and now she's doing something else? I'm like, no. That's great. I trained in education and political science. That's not what I'm doing. The ability to have the confidence and the capacity to rebuild your life is absolutely critical when you're in a conflict-affected area. So that conflict piece is something I think that we've learned quite a lot about. Another is that our targeting, we target um, very carefully, is not just, um, as several people have mentioned, for ultra poverty. It's also for most marginalization. So we ask the community members who's most marginalized. And depending on cultural norms, it'll be different kinds of marginalization. Maybe it's someone with HIV AIDS. Maybe it's a widow. Maybe it's someone who was raped. We don't ask people, were you raped? But the reality is, by the time we ask enough people, it's the people who've been really, really excluded who come into our program. And because of that, you have to program around that as well. And again, that, that group part has been really important. But we have really had to work on, if you know the power, power framework, power within, power with, power to and over, you really have to work on the power with and the power within. Again, so that women feel whole. And we often say, like with the Syrian refugees we're working with, it's not that these women weren't badass. But when you've lost half your family and have and had all your assurance, like us, right? Your your person, you're thinking your life is going, and suddenly it's gone. That confidence and capacity has to be rebuilt. So it's really important. And so part of our excitement about being here is, we know from research that the SDGs will not be met. And where will it not be met? It will be not met in fragile and conflict affected states among ultra poor women. But we have some learning on what to do about that, and it is this working more on the individual capacity and capability, the connections to support, and at the community level. Because for us, and it's really great to hear everyone else has said this, women's economic empowerment is not just about having more assets. It's about having decision-making <coughs> rights over those assets. And so, and not just around, and what women can do and what women can do with their bodies. So the decision-makings that we monitor include, um, so we, we have statistics that show that less than half of women can choose if they're going to have another child before they enter our program. And that goes up to 80, 82% after our program. So your choice about whether you're going to have another child. Your choice about whether or not you can go to work outside the house. Your choice of are our girls going to go into school. Your choice of whether or not the family is going to build an asset. So, so defining agency across a range of spectrums. So that's um, a little bit about why an integrated approach and, and what I think um, we've learned at Women for Women in terms of trying to deal with violence and conflict as well as ultra poverty. That that's that's also extremely helpful. Um, and the the you know sort of engage the 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 engagement with the community both as a way to identify the most marginalized women and then as a way to create a context that helps to empower the women. I think um, is is really useful to understand. Um, so Linda. Uh, we've been talking, as Kate was saying, with you know, there's a whole range of players in uh, the use of graduation models. Um, some of which are in the private sector, some of which are NGOs, but um, some of them are funded by others. So maybe you can take us further into the um, the actors who are from the private sector who are using these kinds of um, models. Um, uh, are you seeing some commercially oriented actors um, take this model up? Are they thinking of these models in terms of their own value chains? And in terms of their in interventions and evaluations, um, what are they doing and what are they learning? <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> I do want to just kind of give a little frame here. Um, I've been working in women's economic empowerment um, since the early 2000s, so quite a long time, and work with governments and NGOs, but I'm probably best known for working with multinationals. Um, and I have a group that I um, brought together when, when I, uh, in Oxford in 2013 or something. Uh, it's 10 of the largest multinationals, and they meet uh, maybe six or seven times a year, twice um, face to face. Um, they're the ones that have been in women's economic empowerment the longest time. Uh, I only do gender. These people only do gender. Um, and they've been together for most of them quite a while, uh, the five years. Um, and um, so they've learned quite a lot. They've become very sophisticated, as sophisticated as anybody else you would, you would meet. 
Um, and uh, in answer to the graduation uh, question, um, I would say that those kinds of interventions are usually, because of the nature of what's being delivered, outside the scope of what a corporation could do, uh, just because they wouldn't have the, uh, the means of enacting it. Um, they do sometimes um, uh, fund stuff like that, um, but uh, it's usually in a different setting than in the gender setting. Uh, the kind of things that the groups that I work with do um, are gender specific and they're normally uh, trials all right, that are intended to scale up if they work. They're not usually done as randomized control trials, largely because what you're trying to achieve is a bit different. Um, they, um, I would say that the growth area is in value chains. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that either now or in my, my next um, session. Um, I think, though, that I'd like um, to start by sharing some of what they've learned um, and what I've learned and s other institutions that work specifically in this space. Um, one thing is that if you're operating at the household level and you're not doing anything to change the power dynamic within the family, you are not going to get women's empowerment, full stop. And that's because the core of it is within the household, okay? And it's important, I think, to understand that the opposite of women's economic empowerment is women's economic dependency. All right, so not poverty, but dependency. And that women's economic dependency is enacted through concrete constraints. It's not some fluffy thing that you can ignore, cultural norms, okay? It's concrete constraints. Okay, so for example, um, in most countries, um, either uh, currently or in the past, uh, it has been common either by law or by custom, in most cases at some point by law, that the man in the household, the male head of household, owns all the fixed, all the capital assets, all the major assets, and that he controls all the income, and very often all the other material resources, food, access to health care. In fact, withholding food is one of the most common ways of enacting domestic violence uh, in these kinds of populations. Um, uh, if you're trying to get health care to them, sometimes the way they're barred from health care is um, not so much the health care itself, which may be offered free, but the cost of the transportation to the place where it's being delivered will be withheld. Okay, so it's the control over all that. So, for example, in one of the studies, um, there's a, a situation where, uh, I think Eva mentioned this, where um, there was a productive asset given, but that over time, the productive asset was essentially expropriated by the husband once it was successful, and the women uh, fell back into um, uh, household chores, okay? And actually the study treated that like it was a positive outcome because we had this cultural stereotype that says all women want to do is be household servants. Okay, the problem is, is that when that man expropriates that asset and she goes back to nothing but the household, she's been pushed back into a, a position of dependence. Okay, so that, so you've failed there if that happens. Um, it was interesting in that same study that the women who did not have active males, economically active males in their household, um, were the ones who were able to hold on to the assets. That just tells you everything. If you don't address that kind of thing, it's just not going to happen. Um, I think also um, uh, on the measurements, um, particularly the corporations that I'm working with have been really obsessed with the measurements. Um, and they do a lot of... Um, uh, experimenting really with, with how to measure it. I don't think we have arrived at a situation where anybody has a good measure. Um, the, the measures that didn't show any movement in um, the study that Nathaniel was talking about um, were, um, first of all, the, the whole thing was enacted at the household level, so forget that. Anybody with gender background could tell you from the beginning that wasn't gonna work. Um, the, um, but the, the questions that were used were all household decision-making questions, which are very much germane okay, to the issue and very logical to use. But if you have ever been face-to-face -face with somebody and asked that kind of question on the ground, first of all, it's, um, 
it's just kind of too general and abstract in a way. But the main thing is, is that it just begs for socially desirable responding. And you can see it on their face. They know they're supposed to tell you that they make decisions jointly with their husband, okay? And so I think at one time those kind of questions were probably pretty good, but at this point I don't use them anymore because they're just a waste of time. Um, one of the things that, that has been troublesome for the corporations is uh, the difficulty of measuring income. Um, we think of that as a very straightforward measure. It's not, not, not in these kinds of situations because a lot of times they won't even understand what you mean by income versus savings. A lot of times they're not keeping a record. A lot of times they're not literate or numerate. So it's not particularly uh, useful because they won't be comparable, uh, uh, comparable across um, respondents. Um, the question of agency has been mentioned, and this is actually where the group that I'm working with has arrived. Um, the, it's, you really haven't empowered anybody just by increasing their income or just by increasing their savings because you don't know the issue of control. Um, and also that just basically puts the donor in the place of the man by determining what empowers the woman from the outset. And the whole, the whole, um, thing about the whole purpose of women's economic empowerment is to get her to the point where she can make her own choices. Her, so she has agency and at least perceives herself to have more agency. So one of the things that we're looking at is trying to get at that subjective experience of being empowered. Um, and, and we've kind of come to that not only through practical um, experience, but also by looking actually at the history of women's economic empowerment in the developing country, in developed countries. Um, many of the constraints that we find in the developing world today were in place 50 to 75 years ago in the developed nations. Uh, in the United States, women could not legally own assets or keep hold of their income until well into the 20th century. The last law was declared unconstitutional in 1982. Okay, so these are worldwide constraints. Um, so I think I think it's a it's an issue how to how to um, measure it. Let me just say quickly about the value chains. This is the might, yeah. We'll come back to that. Let's do that. Okay, that's fine. I think yeah. that'll work. Um, in okay. Our, um, okay. So clearly, um, this issue of, of measuring empowerment has been a common theme. Uh, so we we should uh, I think we want to delve a little bit more. Um, into that. Um, so uh, maybe I could turn to you, Lori. So let, let, let's do another um, quick round of conversation, and then I, I, am, I definitely will preserve lots of time for conversation with the audience. Um, but I wanted to start with violence, um, where uh, the kinds of environments that your organization works in, um, it's clearly a real barrier to empowerment. Um, so uh, your organization, um, I'm sure, is, is, is developing ways to, to address it both as a barrier but also as a consequence of the kind of changes in the dynamics of the household in the context of violence. So um, and it's, it's one of the elephants in the room. How, how, do, how do you think about the, that in this context? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. I, mean, I think because we did start as an organization that was working specifically with women who are survivors of violence, we've been very aware from the outset of the need to make sure that um, that we're uh, well. We see the women's economic empowerment as one way of a of a way to heal from violence, as a way to regain agency and control. So I do, it's not a direct response in the traditional sense, um, but I actually do see it as a response. But we've also, um, you know, if you're introducing cash, et cetera, you have to make sure that that's, that you're also providing safeguards. So we've been very aware of that from the beginning. Now we believe that more also has to be done. So as I described, the way that we work with our participants is very uh, active. We're talking to women every single week and we are gathering feedback. Um, our, our social empowerment trainers are not only meeting women in the classroom, but following up with them. So we have a really deep understanding of what's happening. And we hear often of things that are coming up. You've got to help us with our men because they're not coming to the table. We haven't had feedback that violence is increasing because of our intervention. However, we don't think that's enough. So the m and &E team has just, and, and due to Eva's rigor, has just upgraded it to add four specific questions at baseline and, and where we specifically say, has, have there been any 
incidences of what happens when you get the money? Is there any dispute over it, et cetera, et cetera? So, and we think that it's really important that we and the whole community gets more and more rigorous about that. So that is one, the importance of monitoring and measuring. Um, I do want to say that because we, you know, 70% of our um, money comes from public support, from individuals who give, and we are working with women survivors of war, you know, the impression is often that women suffer the most violence from external actors. But as everyone in this room probably knows, you know, it is intimate partner violence that is the biggest issue. And yes, war um, makes that worse because it normalizes violence. But um, you know, the data from our own program is that um, in the Congo, 57% uh, of women um, report spousal violence. Um, in Afghanistan, it's 52%. And in Nigeria, 64% um, uh, report controlling behaviors. Um, what is equally um, disturbing is that we ask, do you agree that violence is OK? And in Afghanistan, 80% of women say that they agree that a woman should be beat under certain cir circumstances. In DRC, 62%. Um, say that's the case. And in Nigeria, there's also uh, a majority. And so you really see this issue we were talking before about social norms. You, know, you really need to change the way we all understand what is violence. It's to the point where people don't even think it's violence. Even in our own country, whether there's such a thing as rape in marriage you know, is something that people are still debating, right? So forced uh, sex is, is something that we talk to women about, about whether this is violence, et cetera. The other thing that um, um, is important to realize um, in terms of these norms being held by women, one of the stats in Afghanistan, 14% of women report physical abuse by their mother-in-laws. Right? So you get, you get household violence um, that is happening in women to themselves, from other women who are replicating the violence that happened to them, from the men. So um, certainly an issue that is complex and needs addressing in multiple ways. We do, there's a lot of learning, and we're very happy to be part of the What Works um, study with, with DFID. Um, there's a lot of important work coming out about how do you mitigate, how do you design. We have a whole system of, we ourselves don't are not a health provider, but we've built in referrals from, from the very outset. And so you know, we partnered with Ponzi Hospital in Congo. We Ponzied with Planned Parenthood in Nigeria. We actively seek if we can't, um, where things are really difficult, in, um, where, where uh, the conflict is acute. In, with Yazidis, um, with the Yazidi, Yazidi population we work with who've just been through a, a genocide, we have um, counselors who are working with us, actual counselors who are providing mental health support. Um, with Syrian refugees, we have a caseworker and a legal health worker. So we build into our program design, what do you do about uh, this for, uh, mitigation for healing and then referrals. So I think measurement, um, paying attention at program design, talking to women constantly about what can be most helpful, and working on social norms are some of the things that we're trying to do about intimate partner violence. And I can't resist a, um, uh, just a follow up. So, in terms of working on social norms and in terms of this emphasis on the larger community that you were that you were focused on before. How do you engage with the community on changing social norms with respect to the acceptability of violence? Um, so a number of different ways. One is we have a men's engagement program where women in the program, we have different, um, depending on the context, it's slightly different, but um, men go through a three-month program in which they are um, given information about why, what is violence, why it's bad for them as well as for their wives, um, and, and why it's good to not be violent. Um, and for example, in Afghanistan, that program is run by mullahs, progressive mullahs, who teach that it's not in the Quran, for example. And so we have a program with men. Um, and sometimes it's a woman who chooses someone from her family to put through the program. Sometimes uh, it's leaders. In Afghanistan, we actually start with the men's engagement program because women can't even leave their household to participate unless we've done some pre-education work to gain acceptance of the community. We also have a change agents program where women select some of the women from the program who have real leadership ability, and we give them additional support and training so that those change agents help the women advocate for changes in the broader community. So say a woman does encounter a problem afterwards, she'll go to the change agent to help. We have community dialogues. We have community protection committees. So depending, the, the community protection committees are in Afghanistan, the community dialogues. So we've. 
uh, talking, well, our staff talking to communities. And you know, because most of our, uh, we started with um, the sponsorship program where someone pays $35 a month and that supports an individual woman, this cost issue meant that you, know, you have to keep it at the level of what the support is coming in. But we were able to get more creative over the years and we've been lucky to have, so for example, um, uh, Cartier Foundation and ICRW are working with us on the men's engagement. And so they've given us a larger amount of support so we can roll that out. Uh, BlackRock and, um, and Bloomberg have given us additional support. Um, the Dutch government is the one that has helped us figure out how to do the change agents program. So we've been able to build in these other elements of, on the community side. Um, and now, as we, as we engage more actively with the graduation community, one of the active questions we're looking at is what counts as part of the bundled approach. Right now, we call men's engagement complementary. <laughs> um, and we don't do it everywhere. We do it where we find extra money. But we believe in it so much that we want to make it part of the, Bundle. the whole, the, the bundled approach. Okay. Um, but you know, when you've got scarce resources, you can just imagine you all have these debates. It's like, OK, really? Are you going to add in another man before you add in another woman? Is it that? So we need more research on how much deeper the impact goes if you do have a man go through the program. And what really importantly, the men's engagement, too often um, the m and &E is done on did the men's attitudes change? That's nice, but we're interested in did the woman's life change? So circling back to make sure that the monitoring and evaluation is on, okay, so you've changed the norms over here. Did that actually lead to tangible changes in the woman's life? Did she then get to? Um, act out uh, her full potential. Very good. OK, well, um, speaking of um, more research and um, um, measuring things like empowerment and whether a woman's life changed, um, maybe you can sort of uh, define how you see the research agenda going forward. Um, what are the new questions we need to be asking? What are the old questions for which we don't really have good answers? And, then, and maybe you can touch on some of these things we can, We've been talking about violence, measuring um, uh, empowerment, and how that relates to the research agenda. Sure. So <clears throat> the way I kind of characterize the evidence that we have to date is that <clears throat> the evidence for, for the impact of graduation is strong enough to justify scaling the approach. We see that it, it does a lot of good, and it has that cost effectiveness where, where you get more out of it than you put into it. So it's, it's very much worth doing. But there's still quite a lot of room for optimization. And that's going to require a robust learning agenda to address. In particular, we need to improve the impacts on a range of dimensions. We need to lower the cost of delivery uh, and relate it, uh, make it scalable, especially by governments. That last part is a, is a tall order, especially when we're thinking about this wider range of, of impacts. So when we're thinking about designing programs that, that governments can scale, Usually, we're thinking about simplification. And I'm not sure that things like empowerment will fare well in a more streamlined approach. Related, there's a trend towards digital. Uh, and that may go either way. So uh, we can lower the cost uh, through digital uh, and create kind of a more consistent rollout of that program. But when you're reducing that kind of interpersonal engagement, I don't know uh, what the impacts of that program uh, will be. And so that'll be an important thing to test. Uh, for the research agenda, I, I, I tend to think of it in terms of unpacking. Uh, we need to test out each component of that bundled approach. Uh, and that'll help us reduce cost and complexity. Uh, we need to kind of try variations of, of the program and see which component are really delivering the impact that we're looking for. And the ones that are not, uh, then we can either remove them from the program to reduce costs, or we can kind of play around with the amount. So how much you need to give in terms of asset transfers, how much in terms of coaching and training, things like that. We have some promising evidence from, from previous studies that we've done uh, with Village Enterprise uh, in, in Uganda, an even lower cost one uh, in uh, the Philippines, showing that a lower cost version of the program can still have positive impacts. Uh, so we learn from that, and, and we know that we don't necessarily have to do this kind of full-blown version of the program, but we're looking for that kind of sweet spot where, where we get the greatest cost effectiveness. Uh, I, I think in, uh, for research, uh, a, a big one in terms of economic impacts is, is connecting women with higher return productive uh, 
activities. Uh, and so that's just kind of partially maybe just nudging people into choosing some, uh, some livelihoods that have greater payoff. So like in the first round of research you saw the vast majority of participants chose livestock and within that it was mostly goats. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, and if somebody didn't have goats before and they do now, then that's an improvement. Uh, but uh, it's maybe not the kind of life-changing thing that we're looking for. So can we connect women with, with value chains, uh, with national and regional markets as a way to market their goods? Uh, and uh, so now I'll kind of mention a few of the studies that, that we have underway, which I'm, I'm very much excited about and are kind of touching on, on uh, this research agenda in a number of ways. Uh, uh, this one's for Lori. So in Malawi, uh, we're working with Concern Worldwide uh, and uh, Trinity College Dublin Gender, Gender Innovation Lab. Uh, and they're trying out a version of graduation that's targeted at either men or women in the household. And then they also layer on uh, couples empowerment training. Uh, and so that's focused on transforming gender and power relations. So it'll be nice to see by kind of uncoupling those and also doing them together, we can, we can show exactly what you get from, from adding that into the bundle of the program. Uh, so uh, better data, uh, as, as I mentioned before, um, on, on welfare measures there, uh, they'll be collecting empowerment and, and spousal cohesion as well as intimate partner violence. We have a project in the Sahel with the World Bank uh, there, it's kind of many of the components of graduation that are layered onto national safety net programs, so that's nice in terms of, of scaling. They have one component of the program I'm particularly excited about, which is a video on, on changing uh, social norms about activity ownership, and also encouraging husbands to be supportive of their wives' economic activities. In Ghana, we have a study that we're doing uh, where we've added on a cognitive behavioral therapy component. So there we had existing evidence showing very high rates of depression among ultra poor women in, in Ghana. Uh, and then we had a, a kind of theory about maybe that's, and I mentioned before that distribution of impacts and there's some people who are just not really benefiting in the way that we want to see from this program. Maybe that's something psychosocial about that. And so if we can potentially improve uh, women's mental health at the outside of the program, maybe we can improve both their mental health and their economic returns by helping them to be able to kind of have a longer term vision and aspirations and be able to engage more, engage more profitably and productively with their new livelihoods. Uh, in, in Uganda, uh, we have a project uh, with AFSI and, and USAID's Office of, of Food for Peace where it's a graduation that's provided for refugees and host communities in Western Uganda. And that's done at, at different cost levels. So there's a nice way of trying at three different cost levels uh, and seeing which one has the greatest cost effectiveness. And then one of those is a group-based approach. And so it'll be an added component of seeing whether you're creating some kind of social capital that can have some lasting benefits, both in psychosocial ways and economic returns at the end of the program. Uh, on, on violence measures, uh, these are very challenging to measure, uh, and in particular in the context of a quantitative evaluation where you're spending maybe one or two hours uh, uh, with, between the enumerator and, and the respondent. So, you know, the first thing you have to do is just make sure you're kind of like matching on gender. So, so have uh, a female enumerator be collecting this data. But uh, even then, you're not really building up that relationship uh, in terms of trust. So we've tried asking with techniques that even kind of shroud the responses, like list randomization, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and still we see uh, respondents kind of shutting down once we start to ask sensitive questions. So we need to come up with some, some new ways of advancing that. So there's ways like um, self-directed uh, kind of data entry using tablets, but then in an ultra-poor context then we, have people who are not literate, and so that might not be the most effective approach. The existing literature from cash transfers and intimate partner violence is a little further ahead than with graduation. And there you see, kind of after the provision of cash, that, that intimate partner violence either decreases or doesn't change, but not in all contexts and not for all subgroups. So sometimes, for example, 
can be worse for women with less education. We haven't really seen evidence for long run impacts there. Within that literature, you can see some improvements in, in decision making uh, where you don't also have a kind of concurrent uh, decrease in intimate partner violence. So that's like a, another kind of strong argument for moving beyond those uh, decision, -making, decision making measures of, of agency. Very good. Um, okay, so I, uh, let's go a little bit further into this question of um, uh, measuring things beyond uh, the, the economic gains, and particularly the immediate economic gains. Um, so, uh, you know, because there are some people who may argue, basically, you, the measure of success of the program is essentially what happens to the economic well-being of um, the beneficiary women, and measuring things like empowerment is hard and, and uh, not as important. So we've suggested that empowerment relates to the sustainability of the benefits um, going forward, but take us a little bit further on the question of why is it so important to measure um, things like agency and empowerment and decision making um, uh, um, beyond the question of economic gains. Great, and I, I want to I want to get to that, but I want to first stress a couple of points that Laurie and Nate have made. One is we're at this kind of awkward state of evidence between the second and third waves where one study has huge impacts on our thinking. We're, of course, concerned about unintended consequences. And there's a study that shows intimate partner violence, and we get you know, more concerned about that. We must build this evidence base, because as Nate points out, it's a very mixed picture. And it's not only RCTs that are going to show us these things. We have to validate all this qualitative research that has been done. And to you know, elevate its conversation in the policy dialogue. Uh, the, the second thing I want to say, which sort of speaks to uh, both Nate's points on how do you optimize the program and Lori's points on how they do it in a very conflict-affected areas and with, um, with participants that have been traumatized. Over this last week, I had a chance to be exposed to a lot of the what works, uh, the, the different sponsored program on gender-based violence. And it just crystallized for me this opportunity that we have between these second and third waves to pull off the shelf and adapt some cost-effective, subversive tweaks. There are low-cost ways to do some of these things that have some good, proven results. Not everything works, and it's very context-specific. But we can sneak these into graduation programs. I don't think that it's necessarily adding one more thing. If you already are working with, with participants for uh, typically at least a year and in groups and with some individual component, the opportunity to add some CBT or some of the, the gender-based violence interventions is really powerful. And they're often coming from a broader theory of change also about the connection between economic empowerment and control and decision making. So I want to be sure that we're not kind of losing that opportunity to take some things off the shelf. The, the main reasons, um, uh, Nancy, that, that this is necessary, and I would say, you know, the Partnership for Economic Inclusion is a hub of dozens and dozens of organizations, public and private, and over, a, well over a thousand individuals who have common cause on this. And I am very confident in saying this movement is all in on this issue because it just fits with our understanding of what transformation and development really is. So the question is really more how than whether. And I think what is so promising right now is the momentum on the policy space, which is more around economic inclusion, but that that gives you the, the vehicle to add on these other things and to approach it in a more gender intentional way. So there's a lot, there's a momentum, there's a lot of demand for the knowledge of NGOs and researchers, which is an unusual thing. I mean, governments are trying to figure out, this looks, 
you know, we want to do it, but it's costly, it's complex, uh, it takes a lot of capacity. How do we do it? What are some innovative models? What are the mixed public-private delivery models that will really prove feasible? So that's another, I think, a very powerful reason why. And uh, just finally, a final point I want to make is around um, what citizens are coming to expect from their governments in terms of accountability. And I do think we're moving towards a new kind of social and economic contract. If we just look at Sub-Saharan Africa, extreme poverty and vulnerability and fragility are rapidly migrating to that content, continent. I mean, five years from now, that's where all of these phenomena are going to be concentrated. The governments are really going to be on the line. And as you point out, also the big NGOs and humanitarian organizations that work on this, to figure this out. And a, a, a humanitarian response is not going to be sufficient. We will not be able to afford to not peel this onion. And governments are going to realize they have to deliver more to their citizens in this area in a really more empowered and uh, societally boosting way. Thanks, uh, Kate. And, and now, Linda, we have about five minutes before I want to turn to the audience. Um, so let's, we, we've heard Kate's call to arms of, with respect to governments. Um, what about the private sector and how can they contribute to this effort? And particularly, let's return to this value chain point mm -hmm. that you started yeah, to talk okay. about. Yeah, so the value chain thing is, is becoming more and more um, interesting and popular. Um, and that's to a large degree because um, the businesses that are in this space and have committed to this space see at this point that if they can pull it into their value chains, it's more likely to be sustainable. And so they talk about baking it in to sort of the exchange system. Um, they uh, are trying various ways to do this. Uh, in a factory, they might have some kind of um, job training for the women, but they will also do the kind of thing that Lori talked about and do um, uh, interventions on violence at work that include the men. Um, they, uh, on the agricultural side, um, they'll do, there are several um, big companies that are doing um, at least experimentally and looking pretty good so far, um, training in household decision making and gender dynamics in the household. Early returns say that might work. Um, some of it, though, is being done more at a systems level, and I'll just give one example. So that in in these in the agricultural uh, communities, there's one big buyer in West Africa that has just let it be known that they uh, want to buy from agricultural cooperatives that are at least 30 percent women. And bang, right? And so that that is one of the things that they could do that I would call more of a systems level, though they're also um, at systems level in terms of like the financial sector and some stuff like that. Um, I forgot the last, the other part of your question. Do you? No, no, that that's mm -hmm. that's fine. And uh, for something else, the question. yeah, the other question. Okay, so the other question is, how does this um, get shared? Um, virtually all this work gets done as a team that crosses. I think it was um, uh, Kate or, or Lori that said this that crosses uh, NGO uh, researchers corporations, and sometimes governments. You have to get government permission, but they're not necessarily a partner. So there is information sharing that goes on within those teams, and then those teams tend to then go on and be in other teams and future projects, right? So there's kind of an uh, informal dissemination. And of course, people put out their reports and whatever. Uh, but otherwise, right now, we're kind of in a need of a different vehicle. Um, when I was at Oxford, we had a thing called PowerShift, which um, Lori um, has been to, which was purposely uh, bringing people together from all these different sectors to meet and share information about uh, gender and economic development. And um, when I retired from Oxford, which I did a couple of years ago, that, that kind of fell apart. So, but we've decided, because there's a big push, uh, to do it again, uh, to try to do it in 2020, again at Oxford. And uh, so we're just raising money for that. But it's something that people recognize they need because there's no way currently to share. 
Good. So. I'm glad you're going to go. You may be retired, but you're going to go back into the fray. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I'm not. I, I do this full time now, so I'm not really retired. <laughs> Very good. OK. Um, time for the audience to um, participate in the conversation. So what we'll do is maybe take a few questions. And then, and we have two microphones. Tanvi and Alicia have microphones. Take a few questions, and then I, I want to try to get in multiple rounds. So we have a lady in the front. If you could just identify yourself, two ladies in the front. Hi, I'm Shohini Sarkar. I'm with Bluemont, I get. Uh, so it's interesting uh, that the last 10 minutes of the conversation actually came down to the question I had right from the beginning, which was that when we are talking about empowering really poor women, is it possible to do that without enabling environment, with the appropriate legal and policy and legal changes at scale. Uh, based on my experience as an implementer and working in FCV countries with humanitarian assistance work, that has been the single most problem. We can you know, spend money on home-based enterprises where actually the women don't even have a right to own property. The barriers to entry to the market are really high. So my question is, there was a really interesting example you provided about West Africa and this company which wants to what is it that donors who are actually providing money into these FCV countries or into these countries where the status of women in general is not secured, what can donors and corporations do to incentivize and smartly get the policy and the legal environment, forget the enforcement yeah. part, at least the policy and the legal environment to a position where this amazing work that you're talking about can be housed and scaled up? Great question. Great question. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Faribo Parsa. I'm a founder and president of a nonprofit organization. It's called um, Women's e Learning in Leadership. We are located at George Mason University. Empower university women to become leaders. My question um, is to um, Women for Women. Did you consider to engage a women's organization to, who, that work for human rights, women rights celebrities? We have contact with the women uh, from Afghanistan. They are wealthy and uh, about the values. They are, of course, they have shared exactly the same values, the same norms. How about to uh, engage women from the own country? I'm originally from Iran. I, you know, there are maybe if you get the research, it get women who say yes, okay, you can. Um, it's okay if men, if my husband is violent to for, to me, but I'm not. There are so many women organization, and women who are well educated in the same country that have the same values. They have uh, they can contribute. So how do you engage these high educated women, wealthy women to to, to, to uh, support it or sister from their own country. Thank great. you. OK, another great question. Let's take one more. Uh, another lady right here. Thank you. I'm Maria Fernanda Sierra, Sierra from the Trust for the Americas. So I was glad to hear how you were talking about changing the power dynamics and how to tweak into the project some elements, which happened. I run a women empowerment project in Mexico that's mainly uh, to for the women to get skills, technical skills and life skills for them, them to get sustained ability to access jobs or to create entrepreneurships. And we tweaked a component on prevention of gender balance because we thought that was key in a country such as Mexico. And my question is, we do think that it's key to work with men, but we haven't been able to be able to get the funding or since we are just starting in the process, we really don't know how, because this is something that is shifting norms. So if you have any ideas of pathways about how to start addressing this with men, because with women, we're working already at our programs, okay. but with men. Thanks. Very good. OK, so three great questions. Incentivizing changes in the enabling environment, working with local organizations in this question of changing norms, and how do you sort of leap into the uh, engaging men as you're doing this process? So. Uh, uh, anybody and all, any or all can 
respond. Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I'm really glad you uh, raised the question of enabling environment and ownership and laws. I, I entirely agree. Um, in fact, in 2020, Women for Women is going to be doing a global campaign precisely on women's asset ownership. Um, so there has been some really good work done on land ownership and some good campaigns, but we want to bring in this broader issue of asset ownership. And so our lead on that, Karen, is here um, visiting from the UK where our policy work is led from, if you have any specific ideas on how we can work on it. But also, um, I lived in South Africa for 15 years, um, one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. And I saw um, seven of my sister lesbians murdered for being lesbian. Um, people that were in my network. And so I'm also very powerfully aware of laws are not enough. That's personally aware. Um, but we also see that in, you know, I, we, I was just in northern Iraq, and Kurdistan region of Iraq has slightly more progressive laws than the rest of Iraq, uh, for example. And, you know, really good conversations about, like, the fact that we even call it an honor killing. Mm -hmm. What has this got to do with honor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's murder. Mm -hmm. And so, although it's outlawed, you know, so, so kind of, yes, I totally agree, and we have to all join together and push, and you're absolutely right that the donors and the corporations can play an important role um, in that. But uh, um, I've, I, I've, that, that doing it together and making it come from the bottom up at the same time, because when it's imposed from the top, you, you, as you know. Um, in terms of how to work with men, there's really, um, again, uh, uh, let's speak afterwards, but the work we're doing with ICRW is also putting together like toolkits and sharing, and, and there's, there's resources out there about how, uh, what has been working uh, with men's engagement, so we can certainly hook you up to that. Um, and then in terms of um, how we work with women in, in countries, absolutely. So Women for Women partners in all of our, in every country we're partnering. So for example, we're uh, partnering with a women's or, uh, advocacy organization in Nigeria and in Afghanistan. Um, we're working on gender-based violence and men's engagement in, with dozens of organizations in Rwanda. So we are linked into, into those. What's interesting, and we also have celebrity ambassadors, and but what's interesting is that the, the I think because of the combination, when you're absolutely marginalized in your community, the women I've talked to, it's the women who are most like them that make them, who transform, that makes them feel the most possible. Does that make sense? Um, um, you know, when I see Michelle Obama and I'm inspired by her, I, I don't think I can be like her. She's a little bit too far. <laughs> but when I, see, you know, when my colleagues can inspire me and make me feel it's possible. So, so one of the things we've really um, tried to figure out how to do more, and we want to use more video as well, is um, bringing women graduates who have succeeded into the classroom so that women can hear the stories of women like them who've made it. So absolutely, yes, there are. It's important to link to the broader movement of women in different countries who are shifting, who, who, who believe that women's rights is possible. Um, but what we, we, we're really looking to help women see change stories right there that are accessible to them. Um, so. I just want to add one point on the, on the domestic politics of this and back to the sort of new social contract and also in sub-Saharan Africa the economic transformation emergency, non-event. I think we need to find ways to be really smart in particular countries on how we lead with that economic productivity imperative, poverty reduction being stalled, you know, the, the uh, huge crisis about how people are actually going to be employed and earn their livings, and then to I would advise uh, women's rights organizations in country to really focus on that opportunity. You know, the ears will be open about how you actually achieve sustainable gains. I don't want to be Pollyannish and think it's going to be super easy, but I, I do think that this is a really particular moment um, in that continent, which I know better than Asia or Latin America, around that issue. Okay, Linda, and, um, I, it just occurred to me I forgot to do uh, an essential moderator task, which is to say, please feel free to tweet. It's not too late. <laughs> 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 hashtag CGD talk, and I think it's hashtag women for women, right? And that's your, your Twitter. Um, so please, if you have any kind of closing thoughts you want to tweet, please do so. 
Linda, very briefly. Yeah, just very briefly, to, in, in also in answer to the question about the enabling environment, uh, this has been one of the hard lessons, I would say, of the last five to eight years for the corporations, is that they'll go in and they'll try to change something, and they'll find that there's an, enable, an environmental problem. They call it the ecosystem. All right? And it can be the government, but a lot of times it's other players in the private sector. Okay, so there, that's something that really needs to be worked on. Uh, I would agree with Lori that I think one thing that's absolutely clear at this point is that laws are not enough, and I won't enumerate why that is, but a lot of it has to do with, um, there just comes a time when you have to have cash to claim your rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then, uh, let's see, oh yeah, and the last point is I think that there's a real breakdown um, sometimes between governments and the private sector because, and even uh, NGOs in the private sector because they think the only thing they can get out of a private sector is a check. Um, my group, my little group especially, is real tired of that because they have a lot of other things to offer. But the governments don't understand how they work and don't understand what they have to offer. Example of this is that I'm one of the expert panel people on the WeFi um, initiatives, and I've been, I'm, I've, I've done the whole bunch of them now. And uh, you see over and over again that they want to do some kind of supply chain thing, but they don't know how supply chains work. And so, um, and this is on entrepreneurship, of course. And so they talk about networking and, and stuff like that. And they clearly don't realize that the problem for women trying to get into supply chains is after the contract has already been mm -hmm. uh, offered. It's not before, all right? And, and I can see so much, um, so much possibility for the private, the, especially the big companies, to work with the World Bank on this. Um, but I can't make either side, but especially the World Bank side, I cannot make them understand how these mesh. So there's a real need for there to be more understanding about how each side operates. And that's it. Great point. OK, I'm going to impose on my panelists and take five minutes over time, because um, I want to allow or give you the opportunity for one more round of questions, if, if mm -hmm. the panelists mm -hmm. are agreeable. Sure. Okay, uh, there. Okay, there. so we have a lady right here, uh, a man right here, yes, and can we, I, I should. On the uh, other, with the ETC. All right, okay, <laughs> we're gonna take these two. So this lady right here and this lady over here, but please keep your questions really short because we wanna uh, give an opportunity to uh, have um, answers <laughs> to the questions. Go ahead. Or more questions. <laughs> Good morning, thank you for your comments and all your efforts um, in this work. So in terms of men's behavior change, and I think everyone's alluded to how crucial that is, um, and even in terms of uh, mother-in-law violence or sister-in-law violence, that's often tied to the fact that those women are trying to stay connected to mm -hmm. the person with the power and authority in the family. Um, so in, in changing that behavior, um, maybe more in matters that related to domestic violence where there are legal repercussions and sometimes that can be effective in, in creating change. I'm curious to your thoughts about, is that occurring due to men fearing the legal repercussions? Um, I think sometimes the, the women are saying there is behavior change um, due to those, those laws and they're seeing men's behavior change because of that fear. But is it fear that's has to come first before the respect for the women? Does it matter? Um, I think some of these questions could be important for how that creating those legal repercussions, um, how they're created so that okay. those ideas are kept great, in mind. Thank great, you. Great, OK. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for a very informative discussion this morning. Um, so, uh, and also really great to hear about all these studies um, that are going to generate more knowledge and, and, and offer a policy option. And by the way, my name is Musa Blimpo. I work at the, in the Africa Chief Economist Office at the World Bank. Uh, my question is uh, stemming from the observation that um, a lot of the challenges come from uh, the intra-household dynamics. Right, uh, but then the question is whether there should be more effort before household formation, and whether you have some effort uh, along that um, uh, that line, basically focusing on uh, younger girl before they get married, 
um, and school girl, and maybe even looking into issues about uh, curriculum reform that uh, may have uh, room there to have at a, uh, some impact at the societal level. So that's sort of my question, whether you have some effort uh, um, along those lines. Great, and another great question. And this lady? My name is Thierry, I'm from West Africa, so I've been studying this graduation model for a while. And um, my question is, um, for countries that are going through um, unrest, what fragile countries where there is like some sort of war, and um, we tend to see that NGOs kind of pull away. So where there is uh, ultra poor women, they tend to be more poorer than before. And we see that um, NGOs are now working there. Is there a way that, uh, I mean, um, the panel has very uh, knowledgeable people. I, w I would like to know, is there a way that maybe uh, NGOs can push, uh, I mean, can be courageous and, and go in those kind of countries instead of uh, reducing their programs? Because that tend to be the case. Uh, so I would like to know what you have to say about that. Great. I'm sure Laurie has. <laughs> sure. Okay, and I think one final question. Um, my name is Rosemary Garcia. I'm with Creative Associates. Uh, my question is more in terms of the monitoring and evaluation. Um, are there resources to actually measure um, significant amount of the implementations that are now underway? Uh, one of the concerns is that all implementers kind of tweak the model and, and basically move things around, not, all, not necessarily in talk context, but sometimes in interest. For instance, in the science study that you mentioned, uh, the Latin American implementations were very different. They weren't proportionally greater on the, poverty, on the ultra poverty, very extreme, like for the, the, the case of Peru, I remember. So how do we measure what's actually driving and, and, and are there resource, enough resources to actually really get concrete answers instead of just looking at um, four additional studies out of the 100 implementations that are gonna happen? Okay, so four quick questions. Uh, we have the role of fear as a motivating factor. Um, we have the question of engaging members of the household, particularly um, uh, girls, and, uh, people at the school level. We have the question of, the, of NGOs um, exiting conflict situations, and then we have this m and question. So um, why, don't, why, don't, why don't we do this? Um, uh, panelists, uh, you can answer any of those questions, but also um, uh, take two minutes for uh, any final thoughts, basically. Um, maybe what priorities you see in particular that we all should be focused on. I can answer two of them really fast. Sure. Um, okay, so I just want to take the question about girls' education and, and um, intervening before marriage, which I think is a really good idea. I've done some work, a good bit of work in girls' education, and my honest feeling is the most effective thing that you can do to change that whole sequence is to let the girls, make sure the girls can choose their own husbands. Okay, I think that's personally number one. Okay, and then there was a question about monitoring and um, evaluation. And um, I think I understood the question to be something about replication. Uh, at least in gender, I think you're not going to see and shouldn't see replication for a while. And the reason is because that, that field is on a really steep learning curve. And each trial leads to another question that somebody else wants to and should investigate. We're just not at a point now where you're going to do a lot of replication. And I don't personally, as a scholar, think it's the time. I want to quickly add on the same two questions. Um, the, I have been very impressed recently by the work that the Population Council and that whole network has been doing on adolescent girls and felt very persuaded uh, when they were saying, you have to intervene age 10 to 12. There are five things that are needed, and I don't remember all five of them, but one of them is weekly safe space meeting with your peers that's only girls, at least one friend, and at least one grown-up that it really has your 
self-interest. And then I think there were savings and livelihood, you know, kind of preparation were the other parts of that. But I think that's a really important point that you're making. And I wouldn't look to the formal education system to, to address it. You know, there have to be other vehicles that we can use. On the m and &E, it's, it's encouraging, actually, that there is, there's quite a lot of research that is being supported. I think the point you were raising is more about systematically, will we have enough mm -hmm. comparative comparable things to draw conclusions. And I guess I, I agree with Linda. I think it's going to be a bit messy for a while, but it is encouraging that there's a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. Three quarters of those 100 programs that we found 18 months ago have research ongoing and a very robust mix of quantitative, not all RCTs, and qualitative as well. Uh, another program I would mention in terms of adolescent girls uh, is BRAC's uh, ELA program. Mm -hmm. I think that's Empowerment and Livelihoods for Adolescents. So it's a program that's cut from the same cloth as graduation, mm -hmm. but it's, it's very much targeted at adolescent girls. So I would look into that for sure. Uh, in terms of, of m and &E, uh, two points on that. One, it, if you look at Latin America, uh, I wouldn't construe the cost of delivering the program uh, as the same thing as the targeting of the program. So, so the targeting is typically a kind of a, a geographic and then community-based targeting. And so those were the poorest households that they would identify in those areas. And, and I've been to those areas. And uh, th these are places where there are like, literally no markets, et cetera. And so uh, these were households that were quite destitute. Uh, uh, in terms of the tweaking of the model and then what we can infer from the evidence, uh, one of the, I, I'll do a little plug here for a spinoff uh, from IPA called Impact Matters, which uh, looks at the evidence that we have around uh, existing programs and then looks at the knowing that no program is going to exactly duplicate the, the existing program. They're going to make smart changes. They're going to work with different populations. Uh, and they'll look at that and then do kind of an audit in terms of saying, well, this, this program, you don't need new research here. This is based on existing evidence. And, and so you are, in fact, implementing a, a proven intervention. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's been such a rich conversation. So um, on, the f on the NGOs in conflict areas and in funding in conflict areas, I don't know what the exact stats are, but I certainly know that because of us all knowing that the majority of extreme poverty will be in conflict-affected areas, fragile and conflict-affected areas, my experience is actually there's a lot of more donor interest in investing in those areas. So for example, the World Bank, I believe, since 2011 has been making a real effort mm -hmm. to move outside of developmental contexts and into um, other contexts. My previous employer, uh, Oxfam, is prioritizing work in mm -hmm. fragile and conflict-affected states. So, so there is that, but I think, I think the critical issue that is still challenging us are the funding mechanisms. So the humanitarian aid mechanisms and the bilateral and multilateral aid mechanisms are still a challenge. So I remember I was talking to the World Bank's head of Fragile and Conflict Affected States Group, who was saying it's just so frustrating. We've pumped hundreds of millions into Afghanistan and Congo, and it just doesn't make a difference. So this links to your, for me, to this question of what, what, um, what's important to happen and on the evidence base. And I have a really ambitious one that we can do as women for women. So hopefully someone else can do it. We've seen anecdotally, we, we invest in a community for two to three to five to 10 years. We start with, basically until we've saturated all the ultra poor women <laughs> in that community, then we move somewhere else. And we've anecdotally, qualitatively seen that the community itself is transformed. And from my own experience, I like literally believe that the way to um, create sustainable change for Congo, I've been going back to Congo for decades for different organizations, Poor place was like owned by King Leopold, first democratically elected person, murdered by the CIA and other intelligence. I mean, there's just never been any kind of enabling environment. So I think we need to invest in women to build peace, prosperity, and democracy from the bottom up. And I think <laughs> until we can figure out how the World Bank and the humanitarian agencies can fund that. Because as long as you try to continue fixing Congo through the Congolese government, we're not going to get anywhere. And so how do you, and, and democracy initiatives on their own also don't work. So back to this bundled approach, I really, I've seen it. The women we invest in become c citizens, they become advocates, they become 
you know, productive members of the community. And if we bundle even further, and so this is like, it's not going to get cheaper, and it's not going to be a way for governments to scale with a more efficient model. But I think if we can make the case that the ROI is worth it, because you're saving the billions that you're trying to invest from the top. So that's a big <laughs> research agenda. Um, um, and I think um, the other problem, of course, is safety. I mean, we are, um, we've been working in South Sudan. We had to pause our full program in South Sudan because bringing women together in groups of 25 was actually dangerous. Um, we had trainers kidnapped, et cetera. So there are the very real issues. And all of our staff are South Sudanese. This isn't a case of like expats drawing attention. All of our, all of our staff are local in all the places we work, except we have a Malian in Congo. And so, um, so um, yeah, so there's, there's also just real risk factors that you have to, re to, to, to figure out how to deal with. Going to men's engagement and fear. I have, um, what I've seen most powerful is actually human beings need um, belonging and affirmation and approval. And we had a really three data points about why men will be more inspired to change through positive peer pressure. We had a study in Nigeria that interestingly showed that men's behavior mm -hmm. changed more than their attitudes. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Taking the evidence of my husband, <laughs> who uh, was a feminist reading Andrea Dworkin when I met him, um, but who uh, lived in a family, the biggest sexist I ever met was his mother. And we moved from South Africa, <coughs> which is a progressive environment, with a bunch of progressives, to Senegal, where he was the house husband, and I was the regional director of Oxfam. And he went from being the most, you know, yay, I'm a feminist, yay, go out and work, <laughs> to being literally abusive. Because all the men around him said, oh, you got yourself a white woman. Oh, and all of his like worth and belonging and acceptance was taken away. And all the norms were, you have to act like this. His mother's telling him, you're weak because you're doing the household chores. She's getting up at 4 in the morning to do them for him. Um, the community around is saying, oh, yeah, you don't want to work. You just want to, you know? And I just saw a man destroyed, really, through the pressure. And so more positively, if you look at why did gay rights in the US like flip? I mean, I left the US in 1989. I came back. It's like a whole entirely different world. And I think it's through the positive model of basketball stars and, you know, like people go, oh, I'm not really allowed anymore to be completely homophobic. So that's a kind of, so I'm not sure that fear of being dragged into prison is going to do it as much as, one more example, in Rwanda, the chief of the local village, we were having a graduation ceremony for 800 women and 300 guys. I think it was 300 guys. I can't remember the exact number. And the guys put on a skit, and they got the local leader to wash a baby in a tub and then to sweep the ground. This is not something that your traditional Rwandan male does. And you could just see all the men in the audience watching and going, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And because Kagami, whatever you think of him, is actively talking about why men should do this kind of thing, you see a sort of pause. So I would be more for a positive modeling and valuing of men who embrace household chores, who offer to be different. Make it possible. Make it. You know, make them get credit and acceptance and belonging and, and love for being. Uh, and there's been some really great campaigns uh, in many, many countries to do that. Excellent. Um, this, I hope you all agree, has been, um, you know, incredibly wide ranging, fascinating discussion, you know, very encouraging in um, uh, the recitation of some of the evidence of success, but clearly indicating that we need to stay focused on gathering more evidence and doing it in a rigorous way. Um, so I hope all of us will, in our various ways, through research or practice, or maybe through funding, um, continue this work. I, CGD will remain committed to um, convenings and to participating in this research. So to close, let me uh, ask you to join me in thanking this fabulous panelist. Thank you. Great. Great. Nice Thank job. You. Yeah, that was good.